Well, good morning to you all. It's, it's good in one sense to be here, and uh, where I'm standing, it's not so good, but we're looking for the goodness of God and the mercy of God to meet us in our need. I want to bring to you a message from Hebrews chapter 10 and 11, so if you would turn there just now, please, and we will read it and we will pray, and I want to speak to you under the heading, nothing but by faith, or nothing without faith. So let us turn, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. And we begin to read at verse 38. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. And let me just say before we read any further that this verse is a quotation from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. And your reference Bible, if you have one, will tell you that in the column. And it probably will also tell you that it is found three times in the New Testament. Once here... In Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 and in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. But what your margin will not tell you is the emphasis in each of those verses is slightly different according to the context of the book. For instance, in the book of the Romans, the emphasis is upon the first two words of that statement, the just. And of course, the book of Romans is setting forth for us how a man or a woman can be right with God. How they can be just before the eyes of the holy God of heaven. Galatians, the emphasis is on the middle two words. The just shall live by his faith. And the Galatian controversy was that the Galatians had believed the gospel by grace through faith. They had been born of the spirit of God. But because of the infiltration and false heresy of the Judaizers, they were trying to perfect their faith and ultimately live in sanctification according to the works of the flesh. But the just shall live by his faith. Now here in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38, the emphasis is on the last two words. The just shall live by faith. And that's my emphasis today. And it's the emphasis, of course, of great chapter 11, which we're going to look at. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently Seek him. Let us pray. Abba Father, Holy Father, we are so humbled before your mighty presence. And we have been cut to the quick through the ministry of God's word. 
And Lord, when our brother just has been speaking about the arrogance of heart, the pride, the bitterness, I thought, Father, he was speaking about me. Lord, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but oh, that our eyes would see the Lord. Oh, that our mouths would be touched with a coal from off the altar, a blood-stained coal of sacrifice. Lord, how we need you. Lord, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. But through God we will do valiantly. And we ask for the help of God now, Father. We ask for divine aid. We ask for the unction to function in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Lord, come and meet our impotence with your divine omnipotence. Lord, come. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. I want to First of all, read to you an account which effectively is an allegory that I read from the author Ronald Dunn on the subject of faith. And it's very instructive. A bit like a modern day Pilgrim's Progress, but quite, quite a lot shorter. Let me just read it to you. It's entitled, The House That Grace Built. Ronald Dunn says, Salvation is like a house built beside a broad and busy highway. Like everyone else, I was born on that highway and was spending my life following it to its destination. At first, the trip had been exciting and almost effortless, the constant flow of the crowd carrying me along. But the farther down the road I got, the more difficult things became. My original joy had dissipated. And I noticed that my fellow travelers rarely laughed anymore, and their occasional smiles seemed forced. The backpack I had now been issued at the beginning of my journey had grown heavier every day, and I was near permanently stooped from its weight. Worst of all, I had been overtaken lately by an unexplainable fear of reaching the end of the highway. One day, my attention was drawn suddenly to the side of the highway, to a magnificently constructed house. Over its narrow front doors was a sign, and it silently announced in bold red letters, whosoever will may enter and find rest. I don't know how I knew it, but I realized that if I could reach the inside of this beautiful house, I would be saved from the highway and its destination. Pushing my way through the mass of indifferent travelers, I broke clear of the crowd and ran up the steps to the front door, but it was locked. Perhaps it's only stuck, I thought, and tried again. It refused to open. I was confused. Why would someone put up a sign inviting people in and then lock the door to keep them out? Not knowing what else to do, I refused to return to the highway. I pounded on the door and shouted for someone inside to open it and tried to pick the lock, but it was useless. Suddenly a voice spoke my name and I spun around and it was the builder of the house and he placed in my hand a key which had carved on it one word. F-A-I-T-H. Faith. Turning back to the door, I inserted the key in the lock, twisted it, and heard a reassuring click. The door swung open, and I stepped across the threshold. Immediately, the backpack fell from my shoulders. My back began to straighten like a wilting flower reaching to the sunlight, and from deep within me, my soul breathed a sigh of relief as an extraordinary sense of peace and well-being wrapped itself around me. The builder of the house welcomed me to my new home, explaining that everything in the house was now mine to enjoy. This was the house that Grace built, and faith was the key. Surveying my new surroundings, I saw that the house of salvation was a house with many rooms, and I was only in the foyer. Across the way was a door marked answered prayer. Next to it was another daily victory, 
and then another, every need supplied. The row of doors, each promising some spiritual blessing, stretched endlessly throughout the house. The discovery of these other rooms puzzled me, for I failed to mention that in the foyer in which I stood was a crowd of jammed people. It seemed that everyone who entered the house stopped in the foyer, never advancing beyond it as though the foyer were the entire building. This was little better than the highway as far as I was concerned. Couldn't they see that there was more to the house of salvation than the foyer? Surely the builder intended every room to be occupied. Hadn't he said that everything in the house was ours to enjoy? And I, for one, had no desire to spend my life standing in a foyer. This was my father's house, and I was his child, and all that he possessed was mine. I went to the door, marked answered prayer, grabbed the knob and twisted. It was locked. I went to the next door, daily victory, and the next, and the next, and all were locked. But this time I didn't try to pick the lock or knock the door down. I remembered my encounter at the front door and knew you had to have a key. Although I had been in the house only a short time, I had somehow managed to accumulate a large number of keys. Rubbinging through my collection, I selected one tag, doing your best, and tried it didn't fit. Nor did the key religious activity or the key of sincerity. It proved useless. Next, I tried the key of tithing. I was getting desperate now, but it was as powerless as the others. And I was starting to begin to understand why the foyer was so crowded. And then I heard a familiar voice. It was the builder of the house. Child, he said, do you remember the key that I gave you when you entered the house? Yes, I remember. What was it? Why, it was the key of faith, I answered. The builder said, the key of faith is the master key that unlocks every door in the house that grace built. Now, Ronald Dunn says that was the greatest discovery of my life. Faith is the master key of the Christian life. From start to finish, salvation is by grace through faith operation. Everything we get in the Christian life, we get by grace through faith. Grace makes it available from God. Faith accepts it by man. Grace is God's giving. Faith is man's hand receiving. Faith possesses what God provides. God's part is grace. Faith is man's part it is our positive response to God's gracious offer. And he finishes with these words. Everything God demands of a man can be summed up in one word, faith. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Well, if you do, your most obvious question will be, what is faith? True faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Nothing without faith. Now, this is a very simple message. I'm a very simple man. And I'll just make it as plain as I feel God has made it to me, and hopefully it will help you. First of all, let me say that faith is faith in God. You might say, well, did we come here to hear something so obvious, so unprofound? Faith is faith in God. Well, it's perhaps not so obvious because so much of the time when we begin to realize that faith is the master key that opens every door of the house that grace built, we, we begin to focus on faith. We are not to focus on faith. We are to focus on God. Someone has said that when we focus on faith, it is like the little primary school child that plants a seed one day in class, and he's so excited about what the seed's going to do when it sprouts up and bears some fruit, that the next day after planting the seed, he gets a little child and he digs it up. And the following day, he, he digs it up, and he keeps digging it up every day to look at the seed, and lo and behold, it never grows. And when we focus on our faith, or indeed many spiritual attributes that we are to have as developing, maturing, growing children of God in faith, if we focus on those, it is very likely 
that that faith and they will not grow and we will become frustrated Christians. But our focus is to be on God. And if the little child would just leave the seed alone, the life would, would bring forth fruit. And if we would leave our faith alone and focus on our God, we would find that our faith would increase. Faith will look after itself when our focus is upon God. And chiefly God's character, I think. To study God's character is a faith-inducing exercise. When you consider the attributes of God, that he is incomparable, he is invisible, he is inscrutable, he is unchangeable, he is unequal, he is unsearchable, he is infinite, he is eternal, he is omnipotent, all-powerful, he is omnipresent, ever-present, he is omniscient, all-seeing, he is foreknowledge, he is all-wisdom. When you consider his hatred of ungodliness and sin, when you consider his perfect holiness, his impartiality, his justice, his long-suffering, his love, his mercy, his truth, his vengeance, his wrath. We could go on. But to focus and meditate upon those is a faith-inducing exercise. Now, I have had similar experiences to our brother who last spoke. And there was a very dark period in my life where I began to focus on myself and how I had let down myself and how I was so inadequate of myself. And you know what happens when you focus on yourself? You despair. You will always despair. And let me say that there is a great danger in a revival conference like this and with any revival movements of excessive introspection. And we need to get our eyes on God lest we despair. But I also got my eye on others. Not only did I let myself down, I felt others let me down. And when you focus on others, you will get disappointed. Looking to yourself, you will despair. Looking at others, you will be disappointed. But if you look and focus on God and His perfect Son, you will be delighted. And I had this experience in my own walk with God, deciding every day to get a little book by William MacDonald, studying the attributes of God, 31 chapters, 31 days for a whole month, just taking two-page chapters a day. Very simply, I felt myself lifted out of my darkness and my morass and being delighted in the presence of such a glorious, majestic God. If we want to increase our faith, we must realize that there is no virtue in faith per se. You do know that, don't you? It's who our faith is in. And we must beware of having faith in faith. Now this is not hair splitting. And we must be careful of having faith in prayer. Our faith is not in prayer. We believe God answers prayer. But God answers prayer. And our faith is not in personal holiness whilst we need personal holiness. I've known quite a few people in my life. I don't know whether you've met them before. I'm sure they have them in wheels. Uh, and they're in love with being in love. Do you know them? They flip from one relationship to another relationship. And it's not because they're in some way promiscuous or immoral. They just like the feeling of being in love. They love being in love. And sometimes our focus can be askew in the Christian life where we put our faith in faith or we put our faith in prayer or we put our faith in holiness and ultimately our faith is not concentrated and focused upon God and we become frustrated. You don't measure your faith. You measure your God. Now, look at verse 6 of chapter 11, please. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, no one would come to God if they were an atheist. That figures, doesn't it? You must believe 
in God Almighty to approach him. But I think there's perhaps more inferred in this little word is. You must believe that God is. I think it also has a sense in the context of meaning you must believe that God is active. That God not only exists, I hate that song from a distance, God is watching us, as if he is unconcerned, as if he is not involved. We must believe that not only does God exist and he set creation in motion, but we believe that he is active here and now in the midst of his creation. Even when it appears that he is not active. That's more difficult, isn't it? And let me ask you, do you perceive God as active? And of course, and I believe in miracles, by the way, but often we, we conserve our belief in God's activity to the realm of miracles. And if we do, there is a great danger that we will be constantly frustrated and disappointed. That will actually sap our faith. Because God is active in much more than mere miracles. See, the problem is, in our westernized society, we've divided in the church, we have divided our understanding into two, natural and spiritual. And we understand the natural to be what we can explain with our rational minds. And we understand the supernatural as that which we can't explain. And we have been educated this way, not only in the church, but in our culture. To give you an example, we look at a tree, and we've been taught since we were at a primary school to think that there are natural laws that bring life and fruit to that tree, but we fail to have learned that it is God who brings forth life and God who is moving in nature and creation, that God is, is pulling the leaves. God is shaping each leaf, each blade of grass, every day in every part of God's world in creation. God is not sort of at the beginning of time setting creation in motion and standing back and saying, well, let it go, let it rip, and I'll stand back and observe. No, God is in it all as active. And it is a great spiritual exercise. Maybe not so much today when the, the heavens are opening uh, in the literal sense, but some beautiful spring or even autumn day when the sun is coming through the skies, and, and bring the spectrum of God's creation to bear, to walk through nature and see in the, in, in the wonder of the color, in, in the ear, the melody of the birds, and the wonder of God's universe, see God's activity now. And the author put it like this, the God of the Bible runs everything. He created nature and supernature, which are actually all of a piece with no division between them. Nothing in nature works by itself. God works it. He intervenes unceasingly. Every musical note we hear, every sunrise and sunset we see, every birth we rejoice in, every exploding supernova we marvel at, all are expressions of his power. And so, beware that when we are looking for God to do something, and praise God, we are, and we are expecting, but beware that we do not miss what God is doing every day. Beware that we do not miss how God is active in all our lives, and even in the lives of the ungodly. He is there. Now, I have two children, a seven-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. And I don't know whether you have this experience uh, when you're in the car, you want to listen to your music, you want to listen to the news, and they want to listen to their little CDs of little melodies and Sunday school songs, which after a while start to grate on the mind. And there's one little CD that my daughter loves, and there's a song in it entitled, I Believe in Miracles. I don't know whether you know it or not, but there's one line, one statement that goes like this, and it's wonderful. Heaven and earth are not so far apart. Heaven and earth are not so far apart. That's what happens in revival. Joy of heaven to earth. 
comes down. But not only does it happen in revival, it happens every day. It's happening now. And I'll tell you, Brother Lawrence, wasn't it, made popular the concept of practicing the presence of God. But this would be a good perception to practice also. They that come to God must believe that he is, that he is active. Faith is faith in God. Let your faith be in God. Don't focus on your faith. Don't focus on your prayer. Don't focus on your personal holiness. Don't even focus too much on revival at the expense of focusing on God. And if you focus on God, your faith will look after itself. What is faith? It is faith in God. But secondly, faith is faith in God's promises. God's promises. I think we have developed this false understanding that faith is something that we have to work up in ourselves. And I have this image in my mind of the Christian standing before the bathroom mirror saying, I will believe, I will believe, I will believe, I will believe, I do believe, I do believe, I do believe. And they think that that's how faith grows in some kind of a mental, psychological exercise. But no, faith in its strength comes from God. It is a gift of His grace in as far as Romans 10 and verse 17 says, and it was quoted at our time of prayer, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So faith, in a very simple way, could be defined as taking God at his word and acting upon his word and believing that God in his character is as good as his word. So faith is faith in God's promises. There is nothing meritorious in faith. The reason being all the glory goes to God because he has given the word of faith, he has given the revelation of himself in his word, and what we are simply doing when we, when we bring the promises of God back to him is giving back to him what he has gifted to us in his grace. So we can't pat ourselves on the back for having faith. But let me give a warning. In this age of false prophets and mammon-motivated ministers, if God has not promised a thing, all the believing in the world won't matter. And there is this abracadabra concept of asking of God, and it has got more to do with the New Age movement than it has got to do with the Bible, and that is that if I believe a thing, I will achieve a thing, and it can be anything. If I believe it, I will realize it, but that is not the faith of the Bible. According to the Bible, a thing is not true because I believe it is true. But I believe it because God says it is true. Amen. And there is a difference. And we have to be so careful because if we do not have a word from God on a matter, we are not in a position to exercise confident faith. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't ask for God for something that he doesn't give you a promise for. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that you cannot ask confidently in faith as you would if you had a promise from God on the matter. And we must be so careful because faith is not a blank checkbook from God to ask God for anything under the sun. Faith only stretches as far as the boundaries of God's revealed word. But, and that is an important but I believe there are promises in this book, the Bible, that cover almost every area and every eventuality of this mortal life. There's very little left out. I remember reading George Miller's biography and was impressed by many things, as I'm sure you would be if you read it. But one of the things that I took from him, one of the many things, was a very practical exercise of taking, well, he didn't have highlighters in his day, but I contemporized it and took an orange highlighter 
And every time I read through my Bible, year after year, I would highlight all the promises of God in orange. So that I can open God's Word and see this sea of orange promises of God. And then I started to delineate them and categorize them so that just like Muller, whenever a particular occurrence or crisis in my life came, that I was able to go down my little directory in my Bible and look up a promise that corresponded to my situation that had been brought by God's providence and claim God's promises. Do you do that, Christian? Spurgeon called the Bible God's checkbook of faith. And he urged us to take the promises of God like checks and cash them in at the bank of heaven. And you know something, the bank of heaven will never go bust. My dear friend, I think we have a church today and Christians today who have lost the art of the simple child saying, God, you said it, I believe it, and I claim it for myself. I learned it as a child. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, all are blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine I think it was an old Puritan who said, tarry at the promise and God will meet you there. God always returns by the way of his promises. What is faith? Faith is faith in God. Faith is faith in God's promises and Whilst we may pray about a few things and not have much confidence in our praying, there is a great deal we could have confidence in if we prayed according to the covenant keeping God in his promises that he has given us. But thirdly, faith is expressed in praising prayer. Faith is expressed in praising prayer. Now turn with me to uh, perplexing for some verse of the Bible in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verse 24. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Read it again. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Now, that is not the New Age concept we mentioned before because this is obviously based on the promises of God. When we ask in that context, whatever we ask, according to the promises of God, we believe that we receive them and we will have them. Now, that often troubled me as a child of God because that described a confidence in prayer and in the realm of faith that I did not know. You see, there's one type of faith that says God can. There is another type of faith that says God will. And then there is another. And it's in this verse that says God has. Faith doesn't say I'm going to get it but I have got it. You think about it. It's rational, even though it seems initially quite ridiculous. Anyone can believe that he has something after he receives it. Does that not make sense? It's not commendable to believe that you have a thing once you're holding it in your hand. But what's this speaking about? This is Surely, the opposite of walking by sight. This is walking by faith. And biblical faith is believing you have something before you have it. Not because of wishful thinking. Not because of imagining it into existence. But because you know your God and you know his covenant promises. And you know he is to be trusted. And so you as good as have it, even if you can't see it or feel it. Now, I, I know that God answers desperate prayer. 
believe me, I know. But so often our prayer is simply disguised unbelief. Sometimes, dare I say it, and I'm a man who needs more tears and more brokenness. But dare I say it, sometimes our tears and sometimes our whining and weeping can be signs of unbelief. We're so desperate. And our back's against the wall, not because of conviction of sin, not because of a love for the people, but, but we are despairing to the extent that we're even despairing and doubting that God will come through for us. And we must never get to that place. Never. We must certainly get to the place of pleading and, pleading and soul anguish and, and brokenness and weeping and mourning. We need to do that. Yes, we do. But we must allow intermittently our pleading to give way to praising. And praising will feed faith. It was George Muller who said, there are two parts to sure to be answered prayer. One, prayer for a promise. And two, praise from a promise. So you have a situation. Boy, do we have a situation in our land. And you ask God for a promise. And God gives you a promise. Now you've got to be looking for it. And there are plenty there as I've said. But God leads you to a promise. And you have prayed for the promise. Will Yes, with broken heart, plead. But do more than that. Praise God for honoring his promise. And for having as good as given you the fulfillment to his promise. That is faith. We must not ask God for things that he's already given us an assurance of. How many times on a Sunday morning do you hear in your church or chapel, people pray, Lord, we pray that you will come into our midst because where two or three are gathered, you have said you will be there. And it's almost as if they don't believe the Lord and they have to remind him that he said that to be there. He said he would be there. Why ask him to be there? He said he would be there. Do you not believe him? What we need is a sense of his presence. And it is our sin that blocks that. Let us not ask for, for things that he's already promised. What we do is claim the experiential reality of what he has promised by faith. And here's the secret to how we ought to do it. Yes, plead in brokenness, but praise him. God inhabits the praises of his people. We are to claim and appropriate God's promises by faith. And faith is expressed by praising prayer. And we need to be very careful in the midst of teaching on revival that we don't get this idea that a lot of the things that we are going to do, whether it's breaking up the fallow ground, whether it's exercising this way or that way, through negatives, in other words, stopping doing things, and positives, starting doing things. We've got to understand that this is an act of grace and it must be received by faith. And it is God's battle. And there's a rest appointed unto the people of God. And it is the rest of faith. The rest in the knowledge that it's God's work. Now, I'm almost finished. But some will say, and perhaps are even saying in the gathering now, well, that's all well and good. But what if nothing appears to happen? What if nothing changes? And we focus on God. And we claim God's promises. And we even claim God's promises by praising prayer, having prayed and pleaded for those promises. But what if the situation does not change? And that is the question, isn't it? Well, I think here we come to the essence of faith. Faith is not only faith in God and faith in God's promises and faith expressed in praising prayer, but faith is proof. And if you're writing anything down, write that down. Faith is proof. And write it down beside verse 1 of chapter 11. Look at it. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Now, the amplified version of the Bible says in verse 1, listen very carefully. Now, faith is the assurance, or in brackets, 
the confirmation, and this is a brilliant statement, the title deed of things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. I don't like the term, but it, it could be described faith is the sixth sense for the child of God that enables us to move into the realm of the unseen. A paraphrase of this verse says, faith is our handle on the things that we cannot see. But that is describing faith as something tangible yet intangible. I know it sounds contradictory, but maybe this, this description in the Amplified it brings us more understanding. Faith is the title deed of things we hope for. Now, a title deed says that I own a piece of land or property. So it is mine. But before I can take possession of that land or property, I must prove my ownership. That means I must demonstrate the title deed. I must produce it. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying that faith is the title deed of things hoped for. Or faith is the proof that I need before God to possess my possessions. God, you see, has deposited the riches of heaven in our account. He has already done. Now let's not get away from that. He has already done. It's done. Past tense, eras tense, it's done. It is done, the great, great transaction, done. Everything that we need, we have potentially in Christ. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in those times when I feel my inadequacy, I remember, I remind myself that David Leg is dead and died with Christ on the cross. And I am now alive to God. And though the old man would raise its head, and though the accuser roars of ills that I have done, I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God and I am blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ and I dwell with him. And therefore, if I produce my title deed, faith, all the riches that God has poured to my account and I write the checks over again and again and again and I can spend them all the days of my life and will never be in poverty, and his bank will never exhaust itself. Now, you're getting what I'm saying. You must get what I'm saying. Faith is the proof. And I'm not talking about this idea of faith that we just wish something would happen. And faith is not simply your desires, even if they're godly desires. I'm talking about faith in God's character, which is... is, is is kneeled to his promise and a pleading of his promise in praise. My dear friend, that is the proof that God is going to come through. That's the proof. We say seeing is believing. God's word says believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. Look at verse 7. I beg your pardon, verse 27 in relation to Moses, chapter 11. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What a contradiction. But it's not in the spiritual realm, for he did it by faith. And you know what you could do? It would be a good exercise if you get time over the next couple of days or when you get home. To replace the word faith in chapter 11 with the phrase, seeing the invisible. You see, when what you cannot see is more real than what you can see, you're living by faith. But you say again, what is the proof that God is going to do anything? Faith is the proof. This 
is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now I want to read two faith-inducing passages to you as I close. Acts chapter 20, or first of all, let's go to the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 6. To illustrate this. The context is that the man of God has invoked the opposition of the Syrian king. And he has been told that Elisha is telling the king of Israel what the Syrian king is whispering about in his plans in his own bedroom. The man of God had such insight. And so the enemy goes after the man of God. That's an interesting thought in itself. And what we see is that the enemy surrounds the man of God. In verse 15, we take up the reading, when the servant of the man of God, his assistant, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if that was you or I, we might say, Huh? Do you not see? Come, come, come to the window, come to the door, come outside. Do you not see? Look at the army of the Assyrians surrounding us. But this man had proof that that was not the reality. What was his proof? It was his faith, Elisha's faith. And Elisha prayed, verse 17, O oh, to God, that this would be our experience. And he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. Things are bad in this world, but there is more with us than be with them. Amen. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, all around Elisha. Now that is the difference that faith makes. And it's New Testament as well. Come with me to Acts chapter 27, please. To Rome. I love this story so much to be taught in it related to faith. Verse 22. And now I urge you, Paul says, to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God. Everything around him is to the contrary. But here's a man, and he was only one, who said, I believe God that it will be just. As he told me. Oh my dear friend. Let us engage with God. By faith for revival. In his covenant promises. Give me a faith which can remove. And sink the mountain to a plain. Give me a Christ like. Child like praying love. Which longs to build. Thy house again. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. But Jesus said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Nothing without faith, but with faith everything. You know, I firmly believe that even a little faith 
even a mustard seed faith. Even the faith of a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years that is so ashamed to come out in the crowd but touch the hem of the master's garment, God honors little faith. And little faith can take you to heaven. But great faith will bring heaven to you. Let us pray. Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to God alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done, or it has been done. Father, I am so weak in faith. And Lord, your promises are so strong, and there is a great gulf fixed. But oh, help us to rise with boldness that you have infused in the gospel for us. And may the Spirit of God be stirred up within our hearts just now. Oh, Lord, to lay hold by faith upon your promises and not let go, praising you for what you have given already until the realization be poured out in our lives. Lord, we read of men who didn't in their lifetime see their faith realized, but yet they held on to the grave, believing that even after the grave, they didn't care. They believed God. That's all that mattered. Lord, pour out your grace upon this needy people to believe their God again. We have been brainwashed, not just by false doctrine, but by this world, by the media, by the spirit of the age. We have, we have been riddled with doubts from, from our education. Oh, God, Lord, I cry for mercy. Father, you, you pity your children. You remember we are dust and we don't deserve it. But oh, for a token to remind us that God's hand is not short, that it cannot save, nor your ear dull, that it cannot hear. Lord, show us, give us a token that you're active and that you are. Let sense be done. Let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind, and fire. O oh, sweet, still voice of God. Amen.